I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of inclusion design and tell you some stories that show what happens when we don't think about it. And I also want to talk a bit about unconscious bias. We've obviously talked a little bit just now about perhaps it's not always the most helpful thing. I want to talk about a framing that I find works really well for me and perhaps doesn't get people's hackles up in the same way. Now, although, as Emmy said, I'm a software developer, I think these ideas are broadly applicable and they certainly apply to science as much as they do to technology. Uh, and all the slides and notes I should point out as well, they're all on the link there. There's a transcript from when I did this talk the first time, so you'll be able to go and download the materials and find all the references afterwards. So let's start by, let me start by defining what I mean by inclusion. It's a term we hear a lot. It comes up usually in that key phrase, diversity and inclusion, uh, diversity, inclusion, accessibility. And it's worth explaining what I think it means because there are lots of very overlapping, slightly different ideas. So imagine you were holding some sort of party. Obviously it's 2020, so you're holding this party over Zoom and you're encouraging lots of different people to come. You're sending out lots of invitations. If you send invitations far and wide, that's diversity. You're encouraging lots of different people to come, but you're not necessarily giving them any reason they'd want to come. If you make sure that everyone has a good time at the party, well, that's inclusion. That might mean that you're making sure that everyone gets a chance to speak. Uh, stopping people interrupting each other, stopping them talking over each other, maybe even having a one-on-one -on -one call with somebody who finds the group calls really overwhelming. It's making the effort to make everyone feel included and safe. Diversity is about inviting people in. Inclusion is about making sure they feel welcome. Now, in inclusive communities, people feel more comfortable to share their experiences. They feel more comfortable, they feel more safe to share their experiences, to talk about their ideas, to challenge the status quo. And all of this has benefits for science. Now for science, we want to be having as many ideas as possible, as many ideas feeding into the pot and allowing a wide range of people to contribute helps us to get better science. But of course, this doesn't always happen in practice. In many groups, people feel excluded, unsafe, forgotten, and they don't feel able to contribute their ideas. So assuming it's not malice, why does this happen? To understand this, we need to talk about unconscious bias. Now, I don't love the term for similar reasons to some of what we discussed just, just, just before I started. You know, it feels quite negative. It feels quite critical and judgmental. You have biases and that makes you a bad person. And that's a shame because I think there's a useful idea here. So I prefer to think of it a different way. Humans are very good at pattern matching. We look at the world, we spot patterns, and we create rules about how we think the world works. Everything is A or B. If P, then Q. All Xs are Ys, and so on. Uh, and this, this is a useful behavior. These rules are actually uh, enable us to participate in a functioning society. For example, we've all internalized the rule today that if one person is talking, we wait for them to finish before we start talking ourselves. That's a useful rule. But the rules we come up with aren't always correct. And the more of the world we see, the more we have to update our rules based on new ideas and information. This is a natural part of being human. The problem occurs when we come up with these rules unconsciously. I mean, we're so good at it, we often don't realize how many rules we've internalized. We don't notice we've adopted a rule until we see something that breaks it. We see something that breaks our model of how the world works. And that for me is what unconscious bias is. We imagine the world follows a particular rule, but that rule excludes or overlooks some groups of people. And when we act upon that rule, when we behave in a way that only, when we follow that rule, we can do something that makes people feel unwelcome. So having unconscious biases isn't a moral judgment on us, it's just our pattern matching behavior gone awry. The moral judgments start when it's pointed out and perhaps we start to get a bit resistive to it. But that's really what unconscious bias is for me. It's a, it's pattern matching gone a bit over, it's overzealous pattern matching, not some terrible evil sin. So let's look at a few examples of perhaps unconscious bias gone a bit wrong. So first of all, let's start with smartphones. I imagine most of you have a smartphone, maybe you use it to record video, maybe you upload that video to a sharing site like YouTube. When YouTube released their first upload app for the iPhone, they discovered that about five or 10% of their users were uploading videos upside down. Now, why was this? Was it a mistake? 
Was it a fashion trend or a statement piece? Was it something all the cool kids were doing, but you had to know you had to be in the know? No, it was a misunderstanding about how people hold their phones. If you look at this picture, you'll notice the person is holding the phone in their left hand. So their, adult, so their right hand is free to tap the on-screen controls. That tells us this person is probably a right-handed user like the majority of the population. But now imagine a left-handed person was recording video. They'd probably hold the phone in their right hand with their left hand free to tap the controls and they'd hold the phone the other way up. YouTube's mostly right-handed development team hadn't thought of this use case. They'd internalized a bad rule. If somebody is recording video, they always hold their phone in one orientation. It's a bit embarrassing, and it wasn't until they had left-handed users that they realized their mistake. Let's look at another example. I know the Open Life Science course includes some sessions on Git and GitHub, both very widely used pieces of software. I use them every day in my job. And one of the great features of Git is that it keeps an immutable record of your changes. It is impossible to change history without it being disruptive or obvious. And that immutable history includes your code, your commit message, the timestamp, and your name. The, person, the committer's name, the author's name, is permanently baked into the code history. And this can cause problems for people who change their names because their old name will remain in the Git history. I have trans friends who've changed their name and had to choose between abandoning a large body of work or accepting that the Git history will forever out them as trans. Now, I don't think this was malice on the part of the original Git developers. They just internalized a bad rule. They'd internalized the rule that nobody ever changes their name. It didn't occur to them that this design choice might exclude some users until way later. And now, of course, we're all stuck with it. Now let's look at an example from my workplace. Uh, so I work at Welcome Collection, which is a museum and library about the history of human health and medicine. For those who are unfamiliar with it, a museum is a building containing objects and artifacts that you can go to to look at, to learn about history that we visited in the before times. Outside our physical collections, we have a large collection of digital images. Uh, we'd love to use machine learning and computer vision to tag the images, to describe them, so that users can search for them without having to be cataloged by a person. So maybe an algorithm, for example, could tell us that these four images are a man, a mountain, a market and a mole. But we have to be careful because machine learning is very good at replicating biases in the training set. And there are plenty of stories about algorithms replicating the unconscious biases of the humans who trained them. A few years back, Google got in hot water for tagging images of black users as gorillas. Microsoft have had similar issues with motion tracking in their games consoles. And there's a story that does around on Twitter every six months of a black person goes to a hotel that uses fancy motion detection taps and the tap doesn't see their hand. A more racially aware team might have caught these issues before they shipped to customers and before they were shipped to hundreds of, or thousands of people. Now, finally, let's move out of the digital realm and look at a physical example, modern cars. Modern cars are extremely safe. They're subject to rigorous crash testing. They're packed with safety features. And as you can see here, many cars sacrifice themselves so that we may be safe. But repeated studies show that women are more likely to die in car accidents. And that's because until fairly recently, crash tests only featured male body dummies. They were based on a 50th percentile American man, and that was the basis around which safety features were designed. Now women, especially smaller women, are quite different from this body shape and size, and they experience the forces in a collision in a more severe way. The car industry does now use a wider variety of crash test dummies, but it's gonna be years or even decades before this inequality in safety features is completely worked out of the market. So what's the message here? Uh, what I hope these short stories show is that inclusion has to be part of our design process. It's not something we can add later. It's not something we can sprinkle on at the end. It has to be something we think about throughout our work, throughout whatever it is we're designing. It's much harder and frankly a bit embarrassing to fix something after the fact, rather than getting it right from the early stages. We need to think about inclusion throughout. Inclusion has to be part of our design process. And so if we accept that inclusion is important and it's something we wanna do, how do we get better at it? Now we could all just try really, really hard not to be biased and not to be prejudiced and 
trying really hard to do something doesn't really work. Okay, that's not gonna, that alone isn't gonna cut it. We have to actually sort of come up with processes or changes, changes to our process. So let's go back to the idea of rules. We exclude people because we internalize rules that don't accommodate people, that don't include them. And these rules we don't realize we're making. So how do we spot them? How do we know a rule is bad if we don't even realize it's there? And the way we do this, well, the way we do this in science, right? If we've got a rule and we want to see if the rule is wrong, we go out and we collect data. And sometimes the data tells us about a rule, something is wrong that we didn't even realize we were investigating. In the same way, we need to collect more data about humans, about people, about the rules we're gathering. And so the way I like to do this is to go out and widen our worldview, go out and listen to people who have different experiences to us. Because if we're not going to know a rule is bad until we see a counterexample, we've got to go out and get more data that might give us counterexamples. I personally, I find Twitter and books really useful for this. I try to follow and read people who are different to me, so I learn about their lives and challenges, and that affects my view of the world. I actually track, in my as I'm tracking a little spreadsheet of what books I'm reading, I track how many books am I reading from authors who are, a different, who are from a different racial background or a different gender or had a different upbringing to me. Those certainly aren't the only ways to do it. Um, find, you know, find any medium that lets you hear from people who don't look like you, uh, but it's the one that works for me. So I hope I've convinced you that inclusion has to be part of the design process. It has to be something we think about throughout. It can't just be something you tack on at the end. To be more inclusive, try taking my framing of unconscious bias as a series of internalized rules. Try to think about those rules, those patterns that you don't even realize you're spotting, those, those rules you don't even realize you're using, and try to find ways to spot the unhelpful patterns that you've internalized. And on that note, I will finish. Thank you very much. <laughs>